forward to the spring, I know many of you have been working very hard to meet our enrollment goals. Continuing students currently comprise almost 60% of our revenue generating headcount each semester. So we can't discuss enrollment without talking about both our new students as well as retaining our current students. With final exams taking place this week, we know many of our students will be waiting to see how they did in their classes before registering for spring. Although we very much hope to change this behavior over time, so students are planning for the best and registering for classes with anticipation they will pass, now's the time to continue reaching out to students to schedule advising appointments as soon as possible. By then, we will know the students' grades for this fall so the advising time can be used to update their academic plan, if necessary, and to discuss their course schedule for spring. If they wait until January to reach out, it will be much harder to find an advising appointment time that works for their schedule and more difficult to find class availability they need. This isn't just a function of professional and faculty advisors, however. Retention is a function of all of our jobs. Many of us have friends and loved ones who attend Ivy Tech, so there's a good possibility we'll be seeing them over the holidays. Please encourage them to schedule an advising appointment and to register for classes as soon as they can. As a reminder, our fall to spring retention goal for this year is 70%, and our five-year goal is 80%. We were at 70% this year, so it's not only possible to hit that number, but do even better this year and critical if we're going to meet the target we have for five years. One of my favorite parts of these updates is getting to recognize members of our team for their outstanding work. I was so proud to hear that Cindy Hall, Executive Director of Resource Development for our Legacy Northwest Region, was named the recipient of the Athena Award. The Athena Award, presented by the Crossroads Regional Chamber of Commerce in Northwest Indiana, honors excellence, community service, and efforts to help women attain professional achievements and leadership. That says it all about Cindy. Cindy has worked as a fundraising professional for more than 25 years, serves on the Don Coyote Education Executive Board, and is a member of the Northwest Indiana Information Sharing and Security Alliance, a newly formed nonprofit. Congratulations, Cindy. Another favorite part of our updates is getting to introduce you to some new members of our Ivy Tech team. As we launched our strategic plan last January and our strategy 3.2 team began to work on creating a seamless K-14 system, it became clear to them and to me that we needed someone on our team who could lead Ivy Tech in this area. Today, I'm so pleased to introduce you to Dr. Katie Jenner, our new Vice President of K-12 Initiatives and Statewide Partnerships. Welcome, Katie. Thank you, Dr. Elserin, for the opportunity to share today. It is such an honor, and I am so grateful to have the opportunity to join Ivy Tech's team. Today is officially the 30th day since I started with Ivy Tech, and before going any further, I want to thank the Ivy Tech community for the support, warm welcome during this transition. Several of you have provided encouraging, honest feedback, or some have just introduced yourself. If we have not met yet, please know you're welcome to reach out at any time. And again, it's an honor to join this team. Well, Katie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, sure. I grew up in Owensboro, Kentucky and met my husband, Joe, in college. When we got married, we settled in Madison, Indiana, which is my husband's hometown, and we are actually still there today raising our twin third-grade daughters. Beautiful. Here they are. Um, pretty good girls most of the time. Um, <laughs> more professionally speaking, during my time in K-12 education, I served as a CTE teacher in Kentucky, then while in Madison, I served as a building level administrator at both a middle school as well as a high school, and most recently as assistant superintendent for Madison schools. My past experiences led me to apply for and ultimately accept the position at Ivy Tech because I saw firsthand how impactful it is when K-12, post-secondary, and industry work together. In my role at K-12, I absolutely saw and see Ivy Tech as the cornerstone needed to blend education and workforce in the state of Indiana. 
Thanks, Katie. Can you share more about how Ivy Tech is that cornerstone of the work? Over the past decade, many of the conversations in K-12 field have been dominated by state testing. For example, ISTEP, ILEARN, IREAD, or A to F accountability, or funding challenges. However, when our K-12 team discovered the opportunity to partner with Ivy Tech, conversations within our district started to shift and focus on how could we best transition our K-12 students from high school graduation to life. So whether that best transition for a student might be college, workforce, military, we were driven to set up opportunities for every student to leave our school district with a plan, purpose, and a hope for their future. Ivy Tech Community College became the necessary cornerstone in this work for our community as we really started to focus on helping students earn post-secondary credentials while in high school. A couple of observations or data pieces that really led to our call to action, and really it's a call to partner with Ivy Tech. The first one, in Jefferson County, like many counties throughout our state, for example, we were seeing students graduate from high school, head off to college, and then within months we would run into them at Walmart or Kroger or somewhere in town because they were already back. They were already back. Their future idea, that they, their future plan, hope that they left with did not work out. And this observation, as well as studying CHE data for our school district, led us to question how might we be more intentional with coursework and time while in high school for those students interested in the four-year college-bound option. The answer for us was the STGEC, and still is the STGEC, or start as a sophomore. That really helped shift our mindset from random acts of dual credit to systematic completions by high school graduation. Secondly, similarly to counties across our state, we had an attainment rate, or we have an attainment rate in Jefferson County of 31% of individuals in our county having a technical certificate or higher. Yet we knew that in order for our county to have a viable workforce, we needed more residents to have the knowledge and skills gained by a technical certificate or associate's degree option. So again, the question we asked, how might we be more intentional with coursework and time in high school for students directly entering the workforce or an associate's degree program. The CTE high demand technical certificate options that Ivy Tech offered, which in, includes um, industrial maintenance, information technology, welding, healthcare options, that really helped us to positively and systematically drive the CTE completion focus. Additionally, because Ivy Tech does such a nice job engaging the community and industry leaders, it was really a win for us as a school district because we could now join the table and ultimately build a K-14 system together. One final example that further pushed the urgency for our call to partner with Ivy Tech is the reality that our students, and this is across Indiana, have so many life variables that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we can figure out together how to set up the students while they have these wraparound services in the K-12 environment, then we should absolutely do so. So the question, again, how might we be more intentional with coursework and time while in high school was further elevated to reflect that we needed Ivy Tech as our cornerstone to build this K-14 system. Community partnership between K-12, post-secondary, and industry allowed this work to move forward. We focused on two pillars, work-based learning and post-secondary credential earning while in high school. And the results led to opportunity, results for the students, intentionality, a post-secondary credential at high school graduation, a whole new level of hope and confidence for their future is ignited. Results for the families, substantial monetary savings, 
results for our community in the skilled workforce development, and finally, results for our state with Ivy Tech being a lead component, and that is developing a model for education attainment. The work we have ahead is not easy. However, it is incredibly rewarding, it is purpose-driven, and it can make a difference for individuals and a community. Thanks, Katie. That's a, a great background. So you've shared how you got here. Can you share with us a little bit about the 30 days and what's even more important, what's ahead? Sure. The, the, fa the past 30 days have kind of been a blur. <laughs> um, it, it's been action-packed and, and very, very fun and exciting. Uh, again, so thankful to be here. A couple priorities. The first priority uh, has been relationship building. I've had the opportunity to visit several campuses so far and really look forward to the remaining campuses and sites uh, through January and February and beyond. I also have had the opportunity to connect with and even reconnect with some colleagues in the field and K-12 as well as CTE director. Additionally, we have quite a few partners in um, our K-12 organizations, for example, our Teachers Association, Superintendents, Principals Association, Non-Public Schools Association. So connecting with them, but making sure our relationship with them is very, very strong uh, as Ivy Tech. The second priority has been focused around the data. What is our X? What is our quantitative data show us today? And then also the qualitative themes that will be pulled from conversations throughout the state with you and with our K-12 partners as well. Opportunities ahead, we have a great opportunity as Ivy Tech to help our state move out of the K-12 post-secondary industry silos and really shift our mindset to a K-14 mindset from random acts of dual credit to purposeful completions. And we're already doing that throughout our state in a couple of different ways, uh, through TGEC option, through CTE options, and we have several best practices at various campuses throughout, throughout our state uh, that I'm learning more about and excited to develop that list to really lift up those best practices that are already happening on our campuses throughout the state. Um, I've also heard as I've, I've ad, had the opportunity to listen, um, we have some, some barriers that might be creating challenges for our field, um, whether it's uh, further blurring the lines between K-12 and post-secondary. So we have a real opportunity to acknowledge those barriers and make sure we're solution finding so that we're set up for success. Uh, the last thing I'll mention today is with the new graduation pathways. That is a hot button topic in the K-12 environment and Ivy Tech is a great solution option for our K-12 partners and we'll be looking at that as an opportunity as well. Thank you, Katie. Thank we you. We know you have your eye on the ball of uh, how you're going to help Ivy Tech and most importantly our students and community. So welcome Thank aboard. You. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, coming up in January is another start to a legislative session and 2019 is a budget drafting session. This means that the Indiana General Assembly will determine more than half of Ivy Tech's budget for the next two years. The budget process starts uh, with the college submitting our request to the Indiana Commission for Higher Education. The legislature then depend, uh, determines the final budget amounts which will include both operating budget and capital projects. So for this budget the college has asked for three capital projects. Our first priority is Columbus, where we would like to replace the aging polling hall. The new building will not add any net new square footage, but will be a modern facility and enable us to complete construction while the, without having to displace any students. Once completed, the old building will be demolished. For this, we are requesting $29 million. The second priority is a renovation of Harshman Hall in Fort Wayne. This renovation will allow us to better use space in the facility that once served as a children's developmental hospital uh, built in the 1960s. The funds requested would also allow us to demolish Carroll Hall, another aging building, reducing our underused space by 67,000 square feet. This request is approximately 60, uh, eight, excuse me, $18 million. The third priority is a request for approximately $29 million to address our aging facilities across the Ivy Tech system. 
We call this our statewide repair and rehabilitation request. If funded, we would address issues like heating cooling systems that are no longer viable, building ventilation issues, indoor air quality concerns, power failure issues resulting in canceled classes, space utilization issues, program accommodations, accessibility, and safety concerns. This project will allow us to address 400,000 square feet of facilities across the state. The college is also asking for $4 million in a line item for an All Students Achieve initiative. These funds will allow us to provide access control to our more than 700 doors across the state, as well as smart IDs. You know, we don't think about this. We think school safety is more of a K-12 concern. However, be assured, we've had close calls on several of our campuses, and we need to be uh, careful of safety here as well. In addition, there, this uh, line item would allow us to have funds to implement eight-week courses, provide cultural sensitivity training to faculty and staff, and also do more one-on-one -on -one coaching for our low-income students. Funds, in addition, would address some of our recruitment and retention concerns with our minority students. A final uh, line item is in the area of nursing where as you know, there is such a strong demand for nursing across the state, and we have filled every seat on every campus. The college is requesting $1 million a year that would enable us to increase the number of nursing faculty, which in turn will enable us to expand student enrollment in nursing programs. To be re a reminder, the legislator will be meeting from January through the end of April, so there's still a lot of time before we will know what's approved, which is on April 29th. We welcome faculty, staff, and students, though, to join us on Tuesday, January 22nd for Ivy Tech's Day at the State House. In the meantime, if you have any questions about the budget process or the legislative uh, agenda we have for the college, feel free to reach out to Vice President of Government Relations, Mary Jane Michalak. Well, another topic is hubs. Many of you have been involved in the hub process, and we thank you for the dedication to helping us get this right. For, from analysis to implementation, we are so grateful for the hard work that you have put into the process. Currently, we have many hubs in the early stages of implementation, and college-wide communications will be distributed about the implementation updates. As we've shared previously, you can find updates on the hub analysis projects on My Ivy. Today, we'd like to focus on an update on the finance hub implementation. That work was affirmed by Executive Council in the summer of 2018. The work with the finance team has been dependent on several other areas of the organization, which has caused us to slow it down a bit. Since affirmation, though, the team has worked very hard to bring the future state vision to life. While the team's work is still in progress, here are just a few updates. The first area, the executive directors of finance, our EDFs, and executive directors of administration, EDAs. For each campus, a leadership position has been identified as an EDF or EDA. These individuals serve as the lead finance person. You can see the portfolio assignments uh, right here on the board. The details of these assignments were also included in an email you received from me on November 19th. We much appreciate the flexibilities of the EDFs, the EDAs, and the chancellors in embracing this hub and the changes that has caused in reporting and campuses covered across the state. We're very confident we've got a great team of EDFs and EDAs, and we see good things happening across the board. A second area is accounts payable. For the accounts payable, we ha will have one location providing management and oversight, while the employees can be located at any location, or what we call a distributed model. The hub team will complete invoice processing and assist with problem resolution, vendor creation, and banner maintenance. For the billing and debt collection function, the Fort Wayne campus was awarded the hubs. If you remember, all hubs don't come to Indy. They go uh, wherever they can best be performed. So congratulations, Fort Wayne. They will serve as the new location for billing and debt collection processing. The staff will work from the Fort Wayne campus. That team is in the process now of defining roles, responsibilities, and functions. They're also planning the transition and timeline. 
So where are we now with implementing this vision? The team has done a great job with many tasks. They have spent countless hours working since the hub was affirmed. The team is currently working very hard on the staffing portion and are conducting interviews. We hope to have these teams in place early in 2019. Thank you so much to the teams who have worked on that finance hub implementation as well as the other functions that are going through the hub process. So on another topic, we have a new program in January the state will launch called Gateway to Work, a program aimed at improving the lives of Hoosiers who are on the Healthy Indiana Plan. That is our state's Medicaid expansion. Ann Valentine, our Vice President for Workforce Partnerships, has been leading our efforts to prepare Ivy Tech for this new program. I've asked her to give you an overview of what's coming in this program and what it means to Ivy Tech. Welcome, Ann. Thank you, Sue. A cross-functional team began working this summer to prepare Ivy Tech for the launch of Gateway to Work. Gateway to Work is a community engagement program to connect people on the Healthy Indiana Plan, also known as HIP, with opportunities for employment, education, and community volunteering. Gateway to Work aims to empower people to improve their long-term financial and health outcomes. Here's how Ivy Tech fits in. All eligible Healthy Indiana Plan members who don't meet an exemption like, being, like pregnancy or a dis disability will be required to engage in either work, education, or community engagement activities. Gateway to Work participants who want to meet their requirements through education can call on Ivy Tech and enroll at Ivy Tech. These individuals are likely to be Pell eligible or eligible for workforce ready grants via the Next Level Jobs Program, which is the high demand short term credential programs. And because of our commitment to the state and our students, we're a bronze Gateway to Work partner, which means when Gateway to Work participants go to connect with opportunities, they'll be connected directly with Ivy Tech with information on the campus closest to them. Gateway to Work launches in January. However, Healthy Indiana Plan members aren't required to report activity until July. So we may see some Gateway to Work participants as early as January, but we anticipate more will enroll at Ivy Tech with second eight-week cl classes over the summer and then certainly this fall. We've also been meeting regularly with the four managed care providers that work with the state on the Healthy Indiana Plan. Managed Health Services, Anthem, Medwise, and CareSource to prepare their staff to guide students to Ivy Tech, understanding what challenges may exist in enrolling, including prior college experience. For Ivy Tech staff, we're finalizing virtual training for our frontline staff so that we can enroll Gateway to Work participants into Ivy Tech. The great news is there is very little difference in enrolling Gateway to Work participants from all of our students. In fact, many are likely already our students. If someone does identify them as a Gateway to Work participant, we simply want to add an attribute in Banner, GTW, so we can track the success of these students. Thank you, Ann. Now, thank you for Gateway to Work, but I also want to do a special thank you for 20 presidents' updates that you have been directing for the last two years. Thanks so much for, My pleasure. for what you're doing, and good luck with Gateway to Work. We look to help many Hoosiers have a better life going forward. Thank you. Well, in October, we began a series on the President's Update featuring our workforce sector leadership talking about their sectors. We started with information technology. This month, we're going to take a closer look at manufacturing with Sue Smith, who is Vice President of Advanced Manufacturing, Engineering, and Applied Science. Good afternoon, Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our high-wage, high-demand programs that are the most critical to the state's economy and to our standard of living here in Indiana. As you can see, advanced manufacturing is one-third of the state's gross domestic product. It accounts for a $102.6 billion annually. And so our programs support the workforce needs of, these important, of this important sector and a few other sectors. But just for reference, the closest sector to manufacturing and gross domestic product is finance, insurance, and real estate combined at 15%. So also, um, currently over 550,000 Hoosiers are employed in our sector. And in the next few years, the number is estimated to rise to well over 700,000. It's an exciting time for us and we are experiencing growth, and that's due to our employer-aligned programs like Advanced Automation Robotics Technology, and it's also industry-recognized certifications that we have embedded into our curriculum, and also the need for higher technical skills. So current enrollment in our programs 
is 14,438 uh, students. That's up 100 students from last year. And so um, apprentices are an additional 6,539 students, which is up 200 students from last year. And so while that doesn't sound like much, but when you factor in the state's 2.9% unemployment, that is a remarkable, a, a remarkable increase. So not surprising. Our programs have won numerous state and national awards, and we're in the running for more next year, as we are nationally recognized as the gold standard for technology schools across the country. So just to, to demonstrate, this week, we hosted a group from Ashley Furniture Manufacturing at our Kokomo and Columbus campuses. They brought in educators, fluent educators from Florida and Wisconsin, along with their founder and CEO, to learn from our recognized best practices in lab facilities, equipment, curriculum, customer service, and collaboration. Now, you can stay up on all the great things that are going on in advanced manufacturing, engineering, and applied science by reading our newsletter. So please email me if you would like to um, be on our mailing list. So again, I'm proud of our award-winning curriculum, faculty and staff who support our programs and industry partners. The deans and program chairs work tirelessly and they develop strategies and curricula to address the needs in the communities we serve. So with completions as our metric, a great demonstration of their success is our degree, our degree completion numbers at nearly 4,500 completions this year, up over 47% from last year. So our programs are built on industry-recognized certificates and certifications, and that provides multiple entry and exit points for our students and for our employers. And, and while our programs are... Um, our programs and certifi our certification and certificate based, um, we have implemented a new concept for Ivy Tech and a new concept for community colleges all across the country. And that's our new workforce alignment um, interdisciplinary degree. It is an opportunity for employers to choose classes and actually build and customize their program to best fit their needs. And these CTs and TCs that they build fit up underneath our Associate in Applied Science and Industrial Technology. And while it's only in industrial technology now, there are a lot of other programs that are following suit because of the success of this in, as, with our industry partners. This is a great option for employers who have apprenticeship or AYD or any work and learn program. The workforce alignment degree also gives the capacity to respond more quickly to change, and the fourth industrial revolution will be fraught with change. So now and in the future, sectors will overlap to support and relate to this revolution and develop programs in Industry 4.0. As you can see, manufacturing is at the center as factories become smart, integrated production systems with even more robotics automation while depending on artificial intelligence. Ivy Tech is leading this skills initiative in Indiana and in the nation in our work with the Smart Automation Certification Alliance, or SACA. We're developing a National Industry 4.0 certification, and it's slated to be rolled out at the National American Technical Education Association Conference, which we will be hosting here in Indianapolis in April of next year. But we've been on the cutting edge of technology in our programs for many years. With autonomous vehicles in ag and autonomous systems in automotive and circuits and sensors and system integration and advanced manufacturing, HVAC, HVAC and other applied sciences. Our employer partners have been using big data to make decisions and continuously improve and increase the efficiency and productivity uh, for, for many years. But the future will bring either greater, even greater technological changes faster. And this will ensure even higher wage careers in our sector as the skills needed will require more and more technical expertise. You know, we landed on the moon with a computer with less capacity than a smartphone. Industry 4.0 students will control entire integrated production systems with just their cell phones. We do not know what all the jobs in advanced manufacturing, engineering, and applied science will look like in the future. But we know that our students will need to be flexible and adaptable, and so will our programs. And we are confident 
that we, with our alignment with industry partners, we, can be, we will be prepared for all the changes. And I'm proud of our faculty, staff, and programs, and I have visited numerous technology schools across the country. And Ivy Tech is the model and best suited to lead technical education into the future. I look forward to the fourth industrial revolution, and I'm excited to support our team in preparing Indiana to continue to lead the country as the manufacturing state. Thank wow. you very much. Thank you, Sue. Thanks for the update. These are really exciting times in the manufacturing sector. And thanks for your tremendous commitment, not just you, but our deans and our program chairs who are continually innovating to keep us at the forefront of the technological changes. Well, in August, I was honored to attend a special graduation ceremony in Madison. And I've asked Paula Clark, the workforce consultant with the Madison campus, to share this best practice offered by the Madison campus related to career development activities with their Department of Corrections students in Madison. Welcome, Paula. Great to have you today. Thank you, Sue. Almost exactly one year ago, we launched the first American Welding Society welding training for Madison Correctional inmates on our Madison campus. Over the past year, our campus has expanded and added additional trainings to include NIM CNC operator training and MSSC certified production training. These trainings have been very successful in providing the ladies at MCU with in-demand skills as well as earning industry recognized certifications. From the beginning, we've taken a, look, a collaborative approach with these students, and there's a team of people that work to make these trainings happen, including not only people from the Ivy Tech Madison campus, but also our adult education partners at River Valley Resources, and of course the warden and her staff at Madison Correctional Unit. So Paula, why did your campus decide to involve career development in serving the DOC program? So while we were in the planning stages for the August graduation ceremony, which celebrated nearly 60 women who had successfully completed one of our trainings, the Madison Campus Assistant Director of Student Support and Development, Nina Alcorn, suggested that this student population might be a, a good group to um, feature in a reverse job fair. So along with planning the August 8th graduation, which was attended by Governor Holcomb, we began planning the reverse job fair for inmates who had completed one of our training programs but had not yet been placed into employment. So I was at that graduation with Governor Holcomb and it was an amazing day. Yeah, but tell you. us more. I've never heard of a reverse job fair. What is that? Sure. A reverse job fair is where the job seeker sets up her own table and displays her accomplishments with pictures, um, copies of her credentials, print, printed copies of her resumes, and samples of her individual work. Then the hiring managers and recruiters can walk around and see what type of talent is available. Each of the ladies from MCU worked very hard on their presentations and displays that they felt best represented them. They had plenty of copies of their resumes, the certifications, and samples of their work. On the day of the fair, the excitement was palpable. So how did you prepare these women offenders for the job fair? Nina and I recruited staff and faculty who helped review the participant resumes and conducted mock interviews. We also recognized early on in the planning process that it would really help boost the ladies' confidence if they would be able to somehow wear career-appropriate attire for the reverse fair. This would help the outward appearance match the confidence that these ladies have gained through the course of their training. Ivy Tech has a very good relationship with our local J.C. Penney store, and we've worked with them on many initiatives um, previously, including the Suit Up event and a couple of high school summer camp initiatives. So it was only natural that we approach them to see if they would be willing to partner with us um, to help outfit the ladies for the reverse job fair. Again, we had numerous staff that participated in this endeavor, um, representatives from River Valley Resources, Madison Correctional Unit, um, J.C. Penney's provided personal shoppers for the ladies, and in the end, J.C. Penney's was able to help us find the best deals possible, and we were able to outfit all 12 ladies, literally from head to toe, for just under $600. 
Witnessing the transformation of these ladies and the boost in their confidence was very inspiring. So what were the results of the job fair? The reverse job fair, we, we promoted it during the August graduation and over the next couple weeks. And on the day of the job fair, we had 11 local employers and eight different organizations attend. And the feedback we received was very positive. Employers appreciated how the event was organized for maximum efficiency on their part, and they had the opportunity to drop in as their schedule allowed. One of the ladies was hired on the spot. Within a few days following the fair, an additional five ladies um, received employment offers, and we received a commitment from a local employer to hire the remaining six just as soon as they were eligible for work release. One of the employers commented that the ladies were dressed very nicely and they had a hard time telling the difference between Ivy Tech staff and the job seekers. So during the mock interviews, one of the DOC students shared that her dream job was to teach at Ivy Tech so that she could give back to the institution that has given her so much. Her mock interview, our very own Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Amanda Harson, was really touched and shared this story during our campus program update. This reverse job fair has proven to our campus that in this time of low unemployment, employers are looking for creative ways to connect with the talent that they're seeking. Having a 100% placement rate as a result of this fair is something that we are very proud of, and we will continue to use this model with all student populations. We're extremely proud of our team approach with the Indiana Department of Corrections, and we look forward to widening the circle of involvement on our campus and within our community. Wow, thank you, Paula. This is amazing work and an amazing best practice that I hope other campuses will consider. I just left meeting with Rob Carter at the Governor's Workforce Cabinet, and I think we can expect this partnership with DOC to continue to grow, but much to the credit of you and the campus in Madison and the great work done in partnership with the DOC to help those women succeed. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Well, let's talk a little bit about Goal 7 of the Strategic Plan, which establishes our college's community involvement as a strategic priority. Many of our strategic plan metrics, as you know, were set for the college. However, we did not have a way to measure this community goal. So in order to evaluate, we hired BBC Research to help us design and implement a survey, which would, or, which would actually put a metric to our engagement. We worked with a team of campus and systems office representatives to develop the questions and determine which community leaders would receive the survey. That included business leaders and nonprofit leaders and elected officials, K-12 leaders. We sent over 6,000 surveys across the state and achieved a 16% response rate, which is very high for this type of survey. The great news is that our overall community engagement score was over 8 points out of 10. We are very pleased with those results. Each campus, likewise, has received their own individual scores and direct feedback from the community so that this information can help us serve our communities even better. We'll repeat this annually and we'll look forward to even more positive feedback in the year ahead. So, last week, I was happy to announce that our State Board of Trustees passed a resolution efficiently adopting our new student success commitments. Our board took this step after receiving the endorsement of these commitments from our faculty council, student government association presidents, executive council, which is the chancellors and my cabinet, and all three vice chancellor groups. I've invited today Corey Klossman Ryan, our assistant vice president for student success, to provide an update and to talk about the next steps in rolling out these commitments on the college. Welcome, Corey. Thank you, Sue. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to be here today to talk about our student success commitments. As you know, goal one of our strategic plan is all about student success and our core value of being student-centered and the commitments exemplify this. As the introductory sentences indicate, these commitments are all about creating an environment and culture that fosters student success. All of the items listed are ideals that so many of us value, so I'm guessing it's not too surprising to see any of them in this table. For students, these commitments outline the steps that will help them to be successful in the classroom. They include attend class, 
Learn the names of your instructors and work to develop a relationship of trust with them. Complete what you start. Attempt each assignment. Develop well-organized and disciplined study habits. And ask questions and be prepared to use campus support resources, such as tutoring or disability support services when needed. I think we would all agree that any student who works hard at each of these five commitments is on the right track to achieving their educational goal. For us as faculty and staff, the commitments describe the behaviors we, would exhibit at all, we should exhibit at all times in order to create an environment that creates personal connections with students as well as with fellow faculty and staff. Establish policies, processes, and practices that set up students for success and directs them to receive help as soon as we notice they may be in trouble. The faculty commitments are interact with students by name by the first class or end of the first week, monitor student behavior and progress closely, and intervene immediately, including providing timely feedback on assignments and exams so students can make changes to their learning practices, initiate one-on-one -on -one and frequent communications with students early in the semester, and maintain communication throughout the semester, conduct highly structured courses with penalties for missed exams and assignments, but be flexible when appropriate, and know your campus resources and direct students to them when needed. We know many of you who are not faculty do interact with our students daily. It is these interactions that help build connections for our students with Ivy Tech. So we hope you realize the direct impact each of you make on student mm -hmm. success. For staff, the commitments are make eye contact, smile, and say hello to everyone on campus, celebrate positive student behavior, and intervene when vulnerable behavior is noticed, engage with students, faculty, and staff, establish a personal connection, establish clear and coherent practices and processes for students, eliminate barriers and make others aware when needed, and know your campus resources and direct students to them when needed. All of us want our students to succeed, so I know many of you already put each of these commitments into practice every day. As Sue discussed in her email to the college last week, the adoption of these commitments are a way to practice growth mindset and examine how we may be able to do each of these even better. It may be reaching out to a student personally who misses the first class session before raising the flag in Ivy Advising. It could also be making a concerted effort not to look at your cell phones while walking through hallways so we can welcome each person that we pass, <laughs> or in the parking lot as well, as I know some of us may do. <laughs> it may also be learning each of the wraparound and support services that are provided on our campuses. So when a student says they are in need or not sure if they will pass their classes, we know where to direct them for help. There are many small things each of us can do, and while small, when added together, they can have a huge impact on an individual student and on our students collectively. We have many items planned to help launch the student success commitments. Over the next two months, you can hear episodes of the Our College, Your Voices podcast focused on the commitments, with individual episodes focusing on each of the three groups. The first, po the first podcast, focusing on the staff commitments, launches December 22nd, and you can hear the episode on the faculty commitments beginning January 3rd. In January, we will also begin placing posters in classrooms and conference rooms on all of our campuses. If you choose to do so, you will also be able to show your dedication to the commitments through posters for your desk and personal cards to carry with you. We will also take time to share how our colleagues are working to demonstrate each of these commitments in our work through emails that will be sent throughout the spring semester. We are also currently working on a plan for making students aware of the commitments as well. We have asked students to help develop this plan and we plan to launch this work in January as well. Finally, I want to thank everyone for their feedback throughout the process as we work to develop the commitments. As you may remember, our first draft only contained four commitments for each stakeholder group. Through sessions held across the state for both faculty and staff, the fifth commitment was added and the wording for all of them was revised. In addition, the introductory sentences were added following a suggestion from our Student Government Association presidents who wanted it to be made explicit that student success isn't just the responsibility of faculty and staff, but of students as well. In addition, much wording and formatting was adjusted based on feedback from all of the groups that reviewed. The commitments are stronger and more accurately reflect who we are at Ivy Tech, thanks to all of your wonderful feedback, so thank you. I hope all of you will join me in pledging to uphold and demonstrate each of these commitments. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. And 
I certainly pledge to do that. I know that that is shared by our faculty and staff across the college, and we look forward to the rollout in the spring with our students as well. Interestingly, one question we've been asked is if faculty and staff will be evaluated on the commitments in some manner. Going forward, you will see the commitments posted in our materials along with our mission, vision, and value statements. As in the case of all important things, you will not, though, be formally evaluated on them, but I certainly echo what Corey said and hope that you will join me in making this a personal commitment to demonstrating these commitments that really emphasize our core value of being student-centered. Today, I'm happy to be joined by a chancellor that I have seen who really does embody these commitments, especially the smiling, making eye contact, saying hello to everyone on campus, our Lawrenceburg Chancellor, Mark Graver. Welcome, Mark. Now, you've been at Ivy Tech, I believe, 26 years, so you'll have to tell us a little bit about your time at the college. Good afternoon, Sue, and thank you for having me here today. I began my career with Ivy Tech in 1992 after serving in the United States Air Force for eight years. My first role with the college was as a faculty member at the Madison campus. In 2000, I transferred to the newly opened Batesville site as a program chair. In 2003, I transferred to the Lawrenceburg campus and served in a variety of roles, including campus dean, Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Interim Chancellor for the Southeast Region, Lawrenceburg Campus President, and then Chancellor of the Lawrenceburg Campus and Batesville site in 2017. Wow. And Ivy Tech has really grown and connected with the Lawrenceburg <coughs> and Batesville communities. You're a native of this part of Indiana, so what do you think makes it special and why, is it, why has the college's presence taken off so well? Southeastern Indiana is settled along the scenic Ohio River and includes the communities of Lawrenceburg, Aurora, Rising Sun, Versailles, Batesville, and Brookville. More than 100,000 Hoosiers live in this area, which is part of the greater Cincinnati region and is heavily influenced by the Queen City. The river has always driven the economic growth of our communities and continues to do so today. Many industries are located in our service area, with manufacturing being one of the largest contributors to our economy. Our campuses serve Dearborn, Ohio, Ripley and Franklin counties and has developed strong connections with both our local high schools and four-year universities to offer residents a continuing pathway to higher education. We have dual enrollment and dual credit partnerships with all 10 high schools in our service area and specialized programs that give students the opportunity to learn valuable career skills and earn credentials in manufacturing and welding. All of this incredible work is made possible by more than 60 full-time faculty and over 150 part-time employees. They are all dedicated to the academic and career success of our students and provide the backbone of our campus operations. So Mark, it's evident that you have a hard-working crew given that Ivy Tech's facilities have grown in both of those communities of Batesville and Lawrenceburg. How did the college manage such a rapid expansion over those 20 years? Community partnerships and a demand for better access to higher education has compelled the college to continue growing in southeastern Indiana. In 1999, the original 40,000 square foot Lawrenceburg campus opened in City's Industrial Park and we refer to it as the Lakefront Campus. It was made possible through a community partnership with the City of Lawrenceburg. In 2006, the Lawrenceburg campus expanded with an additional 85,000 square foot, five-story building in downtown Lawrenceburg that overlooks the Ohio River. It is commonly referred to as our Riverfront Campus. This additional facility provided the space necessary to expand our nursing, medical assisting, and healthcare support programs. In 2013, Ivy Tech partnered with the City of Batesville and the Batesville School Corporation to open the Hildenbrand Family Education Center, which provided the college an opportunity to offer healthcare, manufacturing, and science classes for the first time in that community. And finally, in 2016, we expanded our lakefront campus to include an additional 12,000 square foot advanced manufacturing center, which offers welding, machining, and industrial automation training. Now, those of our employees who haven't been to that riverfront campus, yes, Mark, you know I have threatened that the president might move her office down so she could have a river view kind of not fair, but anyway, it's been a great... You're not the first you to have, say that, man. You have some beautiful <laughs> facilities and so thrilled that y your students, the community, uh, our staff and employees get 
such a great environment. Thank you very much. So, Mark, the amount of support your communities have shown the college is truly incredible. Earlier, you mentioned some programs at your campus that introduce high school students to welding and manufacturing. Could you elaborate a bit more on those programs? That's right, Sue. We call these programs Ivy Manufacturing and Ivy Welding, and we have been able to partner with our area high schools to offer their students opportunities on our campuses. These programs originated through discussions with our area manufacturing partners. Employers shared with us the need for a well-trained workforce, and we leveraged our relationships with our K-12 partners to offer their students courses and certifications in manufacturing and welding. Very good. That sounds like a real win-win for the college and our communities. How have the results been? We currently have 45 juniors and seniors enrolled in the manufacturing and welding high school pathways. Students who have participated in the programs have benefited from co-op experiences and internships with area manufacturers along with earning Ivy Tech credentials. And the student demand and success of these programs has resulted in the expansion of pathways to include computers and healthcare certifications. It's truly all very exciting. Any last thoughts you'd like to offer? Collaboration and the dedicated efforts of our faculty and staff are the keys to our success. It's been really hard work, Sue, but it's also been very rewarding to see our communities and citizens prosper in southeastern Indiana. Mark, thank you for sharing the wonderful success of our Lawrenceburg campus and community. We are all, all learning uh, much from the good work you're doing there. Thank you very much. As we close out a long session today, I will ask you to mark your calendars for our next President's Update on Friday, January the 18th. But before that, I want to wish you and your family all the best during this holiday season. Please enjoy your time away from Ivy Tech. And I've instructed my cabinet and chancellors to power down and support all of you in powering down. No emails from Tuesday, December 25th until Wednesday, January 2nd. Enjoy your families. So, from our growing family, including my newest grandson, Levi, to yours, happy holidays and best wishes to each and every Ivy Tech family member. Happy holidays.